sing out of two. Would you stand up and walk out on me? Oh, I get by with a little help from my house flipping friends. Oh, I get by with a little help from my house flipping friends. Hey, everybody! What's going on? In this video tutorial, we are going to go over house flipping 101, the most basic fundamentals, the essence of house flipping. I want to give you a bird's eye view. Now, from the very beginning, if you're new at house flipping, this will be great for you. If not, this will be great for your assistance. And like I said, the fundamentals are critical for anybody. So it's good for you, even if you're a very advanced house flipper, because you'll be able to see kind of my perspective on the fundamentals. So this is going to be a bird's eye view. And then the rest of the course, we're going to go deep into it. But I just want you to kind of have an understanding of what you're going to learn over the course of the next 12 weeks and just kind of have an overall perspective. To me, that helps me so much to kind of know what's coming. So let's get to it. Okay. First off, we're going to talk about these four things in this video. I'm going to give you an intro to house flipping, just kind of a basic understanding of what it is, why it works. Uh, then we're going to get into what kind of inventory. When I say inventory, I don't mean like uh, what method, buying of meth method of buying, like on the MLS or whatnot, but um, what kind of houses you want to try to focus on. And then we'll get into farm areas, which a farm area just basically means the area that you focus on buying, like the location uh, in which you are buying in. And then we will talk about what I call the four pillars of house flipping. These four pillars basically make up uh, our four different sections that make up your entire house flipping business. So let's go. Okay, so what is house flipping? You know, Basically, house flipping in its simplest form is buying a house at one price, um, usually adding value to that home, and then selling it at a higher price. Now, there is also something called wholesaling, which we will take an entire week to discuss, which is huge in this business. I mean, it may be one of the ways that many of you are or should be getting started. Um, and wholesaling is basically where you tie up a property and you basically sell the contract, so to sell the rights to that contract. So sometimes when we're talking about house flipping, you know, house flipping, it, it can be either wholesaling or it can be rehabbing, which is also often referred to fix and flipping or retelling, okay? So a little bit of vocabulary there for you. Um, it's kind of important to know this vocabulary because you're gonna be talking to other investors and kind of understanding the lingo is is pretty huge. So why does house flipping work? You know, I hear so many people who they're like, especially gurus trying to sell like huge courses, like, oh, I know the secret, how you can get houses for pennies on the dollar, or you can steal that house. He stole that house. And it just usually isn't the case. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are absolutely times where you can get much better deals than, than not, but it just really isn't the case, especially, you know, in today's market. Um, you know, when I interviewed Robert Fergoso, he talked about how a lot of times we think we're getting these incredible discounts to houses, but usually we're buying the home for about what it is worth when we buy it. The key is we are adding value. Okay, so we add value through doing repairs, upgrades, um, maybe adding square footage. Um, maybe we scrape the house and we rebuild it. Okay, now if you're new, I don't want you to get into some of those last couple things I mentioned, but usually it's that we're adding value. Now, having that been said, um, okay, so let's say you're looking at the MLS and you're looking at houses that sold that need work, okay? And maybe you could buy a house for a little bit less than that, uh, especially if you're buying it from someone who isn't selling it on the MLS because they don't have to deal with realtor commissions. They don't have to deal with the additional holding costs that they would incur without selling it to you. Maybe they have a tenant that they can sell it to you and you're going to handle that problem. They don't have to worry about the tenant or eviction or cash for keys. Um, they're going to save money on their mortgage, on taxes, on insurance. These are all expenses that they will incur. The headache, their time, their hassle. Um, so typically, yes, you can get a discount from that. I just want you to understand that 
although there is negotiation, we're going to talk about that and trying to get, you know, pretty good deals. It, it's not so much about finding ways to like just steal these houses. It's more understanding the numbers. It's understanding how you can come up with a win-win. Um, and so you're going to be getting discounts, but it's not like pennies on the dollar and, and all that weird nonsense. Okay. It just seems wrong anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. So how, having that been said, how does house flipping work? You know, usually there's a motivation. Either the house needs a lot of work. I do not recommend that you spend a lot of time focusing on newer houses. We'll get into that a little more here in a little bit. Um, but there's a motivation. Maybe somebody uh, got a job transfer. Maybe someone died, you know, through probate or they inherited a house and this house needs a lot of work. And maybe there are several siblings that uh, they just want to be done with it. They don't want to deal with fixing it up. They don't want to come up with that extra money. Um, they, they're, you know, there's arguments. They just want the cash. They want to close quickly. They don't want to deal with it. That's how you're able to get these properties at, um, discount. So it's, it's a combination of you're adding value the two things. And there's a motivation. There's a motivated seller. There's a reason why they want to sell it. Usually they want to sell it quickly, but then sometimes, yeah, you're just buying them on the MLS and you're just adding that value. So, okay, we're going to get a lot more into that when we talk about buying properties and, and all that stuff. But I just want you to understand that um, there's definitely motivation, but usually it's a combination of the house needs work. Maybe there's some kind of motivation. Um, sometimes it's just one or the other. Okay. Um, and then also we can get into like creative financing, which we're going to get into later, which helps you sometimes even fill that gap of the houses where maybe you can't get the discount that you need to make a profit. So those are all things we're going to get into later. I just want you to understand how house flipping works, why it works. You're adding value. Um, and that is how you are able to make a profit as long as you follow the numbers, which we will go over. Okay. Um, ways you can profit from house flipping. I already talked about your adding value. You can add square footage, you can build houses. Um, and then there's something else called wholesaling, which I mentioned as well, which we'll dive more into that, but there's just all different kinds of ways that you can profit from flipping houses. Now, what should you expect? You know, people all the time, like I think this business or any business, I don't know if it's because you got the gurus out there selling the get rich quick, you know, it's super easy. I'll show you how to do it. Here's my, it's just ridiculous. You know, I was at the, uh, on the pier the other day with my son trying to fish. He wanted to go fishing. I'm not much of a fisherman, but in the background, I heard this radio, uh, state, there was, there was this radio station and this commercial about, Oh, I'm going to show you my secret formula and you're going to get rich. And it's just all this nonsense. And I guarantee you behind that, there's like a 25 or $40,000 coaching program. You know, someone else who just joined us in the, the, the coaching program here, they, they paid $27,000. Um, then some guy, like they can write him emails for a few months and they said the information, there's really no content behind it. The guy kind of answers the questions. Guarantee there's this company that sold them this really expensive course and is now paying someone like $12 an hour to respond to a few emails. And it's just, it's crazy guys, what goes on out there. So, um, I want you to be realistic. Okay. I know I got on a tangent there, but I'm really passionate about this. I, I want you to be realistic because if you think this is a get rich quick thing, and that tomorrow you're just going to go make an offer on a house and make $20,000, then you're wrong. You're wrong. You know, someone else who wanted to join the group said, can you guarantee me I'll make my money back after a month? No, I can almost guarantee you that you probably will not. Okay. But you need to fail quickly. That's the whole reason why the program is called fail fast. You need to act as if, um, you need to do everything you can to make it happen now, but then be mentally ready for it to happen a little bit later on. So I just got done with an interview with um, my good friend and who's going to actually be joining us on as a mentor, Andy McFarland. And he was talking about the 10,000 hour principle of you essentially become an expert at something after 10,000 hours. Okay. Now that sounds like a long time. And I'm not saying that you're not going to make any money before 10,000 hours. I'm just telling you, you know, it takes a long time. So I calculated it out. And I believe if you're, if you're working 50 hours a week, you know, whether it's studying or action taking or but experience in house flipping. so full-time in house flipping after about four years you're gonna have a should have a pretty good idea of what you're doing right so um let, let's kind of break that down a little bit i i don't think you need four hours to 
four years to start being successful in this business. I don't, you know, I got my brother, Steven, uh, who did it. It took him three months to start closing deals. Kale took two, but he has a team behind him. Right. Um, so I, most people, it seems like it takes them anywhere from six months to a year. And those are people who take action. Those are people who go for it. The people who just are lurkers or go from investment meeting to investment meeting, don't join a group like this and aren't doing the things that they should do. I know a lot of people haven't even made an offer and they've been in this business for two to three years. It's insane. Those people, yes, it is going to take much longer. Without the action, it's not going to happen. So having that been said, though, I feel like a very realistic, to give yourself a realistic time frame. if you are working very hard, um, I don't want to say maybe not quite full-time, but putting in a, a lot of effort, taking a lot of action, yeah, six months to a year is probably what you should plan on. If you are doing this full time, you could probably do it in three months to six months, but you got to really give it your all. You got to have, you got to be spinning on, you know, you got to be doing everything the right way. Okay. Is it possible to do it sooner? Yeah. If you're going to be wholesaling and, you know, you guys are really speeding up your learning process by taking, you know, this program and being a part of this group. It is possible to get a house under contract within a month. Um, it's possible to do it within a couple of weeks. I just want you to I want you to push to do it now, but I want you to have that realistic expectation that you probably won't get rich like overnight. Okay. And I think that's just important to to lay that expectation out from the beginning. This is your craft. I mean, people go to school for 10 years, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to learn how to make enough money so they can now then pay off that debt, right? Um, this is your craft, you know, treat it as such, give it the time it deserves. But I tell you what it is and can be uh, a lot quicker than a lot of other avenues, because you're dealing with a, a huge asset, right? You're dealing with an asset that you can collateralize that you can raise money just off of having that asset. It's beautiful. There's nothing else like it. You can't just go start a business and go to a bank and, and say, Hey, can you give me money for my business? I mean, you got, it's really hard. It can be done, right? It, they do do it. They do it, but it's really tough. If you buy a house or get a house under contract, just by getting that house, you can get financing for your business, right? Cause that is your business. So it's, Oh, it's really cool. It's really exciting. And moving on to the next slide. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little about inventory. Is this the house? that you should be buying? What do you think? Probably not. Okay. So when you are focusing on what houses to buy, you want to focus on homes that have a large buyer's pool. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that? That's something different for every home. Now you guys know that I buy all throughout Southern California and I'm going out to other States and whatnot, a couple of them. And you know, what I would buy in the outskirts of California, like the high desert type areas, like Barstow in the desert, like on your way to to Vegas is going to be way different than the the price point that I would buy or with a, a good buyer's pool, what I would call in like Orange County or San Diego or a more coastal county. And then you got Inland Empire, which is kind of in the middle. Okay. So if I'm like up in the high desert and I'm, it's like a $200,000 house, that's starting to get kind of expensive. I just want to, I'd still buy it if the price is right, if the numbers are right, but I'm going to be a little more careful. If it's in Orange County, $500,000, if, if it's a good home, um, with a lot of buyers all day long, all day long. Okay. So you do not want to be, especially as a new investor, you do not want to be buying this mansion here for millions of dollars, especially in a neighborhood where, you know, houses are selling for 500,000 or something like that. Right. Or a couple hundred thousand. You do not want to be the guy buying the McMansion up on the Hill when all the houses are normal houses are right here. Okay. On the flip side of that, you don't want to buy, you know, the one bedroom shack out in the middle of nowhere, and just probably not enough, a lot of buyers for it. You know, I don't know many families that think I want to go buy me a one bedroom, a one bath house, um, out in the middle of nowhere, 500 square feet. That'd be great for me and my family. You know, it's just, it's just not what people look for. Okay. So keep that in mind, unless it's something that you're going to be adding square feet to it's in like a coastal area or an area that has high price per dollar square feet, then, then there's an opportunity there. Okay. But we'll get into that. Um, more later. Okay. So you want to have a good, strong buyer's pool. You want to have, you know, entry level type house. This is especially as you're new, as you get more advanced, if you want to buy more expensive houses that aren't necessarily entry level for that area, 
then okay. You know, you can consider that. Be careful. It, it can be really risky. Um, but uh, for when you're just getting started, like these are some really good guidelines for you to, to start out. Um, low days on market, meaning this is kind of the same idea. This is going to tell you if there's a big buyer's pull. It's kind of an indication. And DOM, that's another term you, you'll see in here. Days on market is what it stands for. So you don't want to look for houses that sit on the market when you go to sell them for like six months. Because there are some areas that the houses will sell. It's just there's not a big enough buyer's pull. So it's going to sit there for six months or a year. Maybe it's just like really high end or um, not that it's not desirable, it's just not as many buyers or sometimes just houses out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, I recently stopped buying in a couple areas, not recently, it's been over a year or so now, because we just realized, you know, these houses are just sitting a long time. It's taken a lot of holding costs. And it's just higher risk. I just didn't like it. I wanted to sell them and be done with it. Okay. Now for me personally, in some of those areas, a couple of them I just don't even bother. I don't want to spend my time in it. I would maybe consider them. If it was like a super low discount, but I've just found highest and best use of my time is just to tell people, yeah, I'm not interested really. Okay. I mean, it's gotta be a super deal, right? But eh, not so much. Okay. So uh, I put two to four bedrooms. Once again, you just don't want that one bedroom. Two is okay, but just make sure that you have homes in that area that have two bedrooms. Uh, you know, that people are buying those. Um, four works. The point is you just don't need a huge house. I put a thousand to 1700 square feet. Once again, guidelines okay if you're doing like a direct mail campaign and someone calls you and they have a 2,000 square foot home and they're motivated and ready to go oh sorry Justin told me um I can't buy this house it's over 1,700 square feet no don't do that <laughs> don't do that okay um I'm just talking as like a main focus all right because because when you do these mailings or you're making offers on the MLS you can kind of narrow down what you're looking for. And I'm just saying like, uh, this is just a good solid number to kind of start with as you're getting going. And then you can adjust from there. Um, year, I put 1950 to 1975. Reason being before 1950, codes weren't as strict. And you get into um, homes that that have, uh, when houses are older, like it has to go through a lot of times, historic historical community and that is a huge pain and you got to make the house like exactly how it was, but a little different. And oh my goodness, it is such a pain and, and the, it's just a pain. So, um, you kind of don't want to get into houses there too. Old. Plus there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of things that you did not expect. Now, will I buy houses that old? Yeah, I will. Okay. But I'm, once again, I'm talking about at the beginning, you know, uh, don't get, you know, once again, if you get that motivated call and the house is older, don't say, Oh, sorry. No. Uh, but maybe if it seems like a little much for you to take on, then you wholesale that one off. Okay. And then I put up to 1975. Once again, you can buy houses that are um, newer. But what I've found is if you are looking like on the MLS, so you're looking for houses that are newer because you think easy paint and carpet in today's market, like it's just really hard to buy those at good enough discount at a good enough discount because you have too many homeowners that are buying those houses and they can get them financed. So they're willing to pay a little more. They're like, hey, we can put carpet and paint in this house, right? Um, so it's just a little bit harder. And I found that it's good to, you want to be open-minded, but you want to kind of know what you're looking for more or less. You want to have kind of an idea of what you're trying to accomplish. Otherwise, you might spend a lot of time on stuff that is never really going to yield uh, any fruits, okay? So you can adjust these. Once again, if it comes delivered to you, great. But as a focus, this is kind of what you want to look for more or less as you're starting up and then you can adjust. And I put middle of the road fix ups, meaning if it only needs carpet and paint, <coughs> me personally, especially on the MLS, like I'm not going to waste my time even making an offer because I know it's going to get uh, sold for more than what I'm willing to pay. It's going to get a bit of too high. And then if you're newer and you're buying houses that have, you know, cracked foundations and just major, major issues, it, it's going to be tough. For really high-end houses, you're probably getting in uh, over your head just a little bit. So for the beginning, you know, as you're getting going, as you're getting your feet wet, as you're putting in those hours, those 10,000 hours, yeah, um, you know, it's a lot less. It's a, What did I come up with? It's uh, like 600 or 1250, 1200. Anyway, um, so it's a lot less hours if you're if you're just going for the, the monthly thing, right, uh, to get started. So Mill the road fix-ups. 
that's what you want to focus on. The house needs a lot of work or needs work, but it's not anything like a burn down or anything too crazy like that. Okay. All right. So that's that for inventory. Let's talk a little about your farm area. Okay. So farm area just basically means the area in which you are going to focus on. So we talked about inventory. What are you going to look for in that area? Farm area is the location. So, and this could mean your farm area could be a city. It could be a zip code or a few cities or a few zip codes. It could be a county. It could be several counties. It could be an entire state. And in my case, it's starting to be, you know, Southern California and a couple other states, parts of those states that I'm focusing in. So that is your farm area. <clears throat> when you're starting out, I would pick a farm area that is as close to you as possible. And the reason why is because you already have a lot going on, a lot you're learning. If you're having to drive like an hour or two just to get to these houses, and that's going to suck up all your time. So I would try to be within 30 minutes. I and mean, if you can do your own neighborhood, your own city, great. But within 30 minutes, middle of the road, entry level houses, once again, uh, a neighborhood that is not too new. So if in your area, you wouldn't call that uh, for that area, you wouldn't call it, you know, the kind of medium price range, if it's not kind of like the entry level or um, mid level housing, I would go outside of that and try to go within 30 minutes, uh, my, um, 30, 30 minute mile radius. If you have to go a little further, do it. I, most areas, I'd say just about any area within an hour, there are some areas that, that would work perfectly, but 30 minutes, usually will do it unless you're really out in the middle of nowhere. Um, okay. Once again, that's another point. If you are in the middle of nowhere, then you may be your own city or backyard may not be the best, but you can, you can try it out. Um, then it says, then drill deeper or go wider. So over time, just pick an area, you know, um, down here below, I say, think less, do more, right? Pick an area, whatever comes to your mind, just start. You know, I recently had someone ask me, how do I know what farm area to, to you know, whatever comes to your mind is probably where you should start and then adjust from there. But this will give you a good idea. Close by mid-level, once again, entry housing, <coughs> adjust your farm area if that's not there. A neighborhood that is not too new, maybe not too old to, to our point from before. And then you adjust as you go. Um, no lead left behind. Now, th this is a, something that my brother Steven said to me uh, the other day you know, regarding a lead that he had. And that once again goes off of if somebody calls you that doesn't fit this exact criteria, criteria, maybe it's out of your farm area, then that's fine. You can try to lock that property up just by, um, and we'll get into more how you can do this later on, but just try to do what's called a desktop appraisal, get an idea of what you think it's worth, throw out an offer. If they seem motivated, then you can work with a, a rehabber and you can um, sell the property to them, okay? And they'll pay you a fee for finding them that property. So it's a beautiful thing. Don't just tell people, no, sorry, that's not my farm area. Cause you're going to get calls as people get to know you more. You might mail to someone who you think is in this area, but they have a house outside of the area. Don't just let those leads go to the wayside. Okay. And we're in the Facebook group, the forum group. Uh, you can go in there anytime. If you have a lead or have questions about any of these things, we're here for you. All right. Um, and then I say, the reason I say, well, sort of is, because there are some leads that you're going to get from wholes wholesalers and agents and just that aren't really leads. They're leads, but they're not leads. No one has them tied up. You don't have a motivated seller calling you. Um, so when I say no lead left behind, sort of, you're going to learn over time that there are some things that just waste your time. And if you allow those things to keep wasting your time, then you're not really going to get anywhere. So we'll keep talking about all these things. Repetition is key here. Um, ask any questions you have, but hopefully that makes sense. Think less, do more, AKA fail fast. That's what the program's all about. You're going to change it up anyway. You're going to be adjusting all the time. So get out there, pick a farm area, get some inventory and, uh, start making some offers, but we will get to that here shortly as well. All right. The four pillars of house flipping. So this is essentially what makes up your entire house flipping business. These four pillars, these four 
sections or areas of your business. They can almost be broken down to like separate individual businesses. I mean, they but they work, yet they work together, okay? So buying is actually broken down into, you know, two parts. Uh, you have the deal analysis, which, um, you know, you need to understand how to evaluate these properties. How do you know what to offer on a house so that you don't lose money or so you have a really good chance of not losing money because nothing is ever guaranteed, right? Um, so we are going to focus on that in the next video. We're going to talk about the five steps of deal analysis and then we'll have a separate video on each one of those and break that down because that is, to me, buying is the most important pillar. You can run an entire business if you know how to buy properly. But if buying is the most important pillar, then deal analysis, understanding what to offer on a property, understanding returns um, and, and projected profit, that is the foundation of everything. Without it, you're dead in the water. I didn't learn how to do proper deal analysis for like three and a half years. And that's in spending over $40,000 in education getting, you know, mentors and being in these expensive mastermind groups and having these coaches that never even taught me this very basic uh, fundamental principle, okay? So I cannot overemphasize the importance of that enough. Even very experienced investors that um, I know, um, many of them don't even understand the, in my opinion, the best way to properly analyze deals, understand returns, so we'll be diving a lot into that. And then starting next week, we'll be getting into all the different methods of buying. Um, how you can make offers on the MLS, how you can work with agents, um, real estate owned REO properties, which are bank owned properties, short sales. Uh, we'll even eh, probably touch on trustee sales, even though it's not really the way that I'm buying right now. It's not really a really popular way of buying right now. Then we'll really dive into working directly with sellers, meaning you're not working with an agent, um, direct, uh, direct to seller, which is basically, you know, direct mail, direct marketing, online marketing, which we just bought a house through online marketing and Kel is currently negotiating another one. So I'm loving that. Um, Danny Johnson is, that's the main way he buys houses. He's one of my good friends. He has a site, flippingjunkie.com, and he is going to come on and uh, help us create, if you're interested, help you create your own website. So it's gonna be pretty exciting, lead generating website. He's gonna be talking about uh, how how you can do dir a direct marketing through internet marketing, okay? I'm tongue twister there. We'll be talking about direct mail, we'll be talking about uh, bandit signs. We'll be talking about driving for dollars. We'll be talking about all kinds of stuff, how to find the list, how to mail them, all, all that stuff. So that'll all be covered um, next week. We're going to take two weeks to cover buying. So we're going to take a few more days here to cover uh, deal analysis because it's huge. And then two solid weeks of buying. And then we'll continue to talk about these things as we go because this is the foundation of everything. Then we'll get into financing um, and different ways you can do that, whether it's private money, uh, hard money, joint venturing, and wholesaling, which I consider kind of a form of financing will be covered as well, and creative financing, which is huge as well. So do you need money to be a real estate investor? No. Does it help? Yes. Does it have to be your money? No, <laughs> not necessarily. Um, so we're going to teach you all those things so you can understand how to leverage other people's money, OPM, and um, and all that creative fun stuff, okay? And so you can understand financing really well. Then we will be getting into rehabbing and be talking about how to hire contractors, estimating repairs, um, all that fun stuff. Not only estimating repairs, but finalizing repairs and managing the rehab process, what kind of materials you should use. Uh, we'll be getting into all of that, but that is pillar number three. And then pillar number four is selling. With selling, 
we try not to overcomplicate it. You know, for most of our houses, we put them on the MLS, make sure we have good pictures, good description. But then, you know, there is a pretty detailed actual process. Um, a lot of the steps, you know, since I've been teaching, there's a lot of things I've realized that I kind of overlook when I'm teaching. And I've gotten a lot better at that because I've learned from questions people ask. So we'll be teaching you all the steps that once you go to put a house up for sale and then once you get a buyer, so not only selling but closing and how to deal with the appraisal and how to uh, negotiate and how to handle the, the workflow of calls coming in and going and seeing the pro all that stuff will be covered. Okay, and then of course the systems to bring it all together and create the machine that we're trying to create. So the idea here, guys, is if you are new to this business, then you gotta learn the fundamentals first, okay? And then as you know the fundamentals, you can bit by bit start to leverage other people's time, money, experience, build relationships. Um, and over time, you're gonna create your machine, your house flipping machine, and that's what it is truly all about, okay? Um, what's next here? All right, so quick recap. Uh, we just talked about an introduction to the house flipping, why it works. Uh, we talked about motivated sellers, uh, but you're also creating value. It's not like we're buying houses for pennies on the dollar, ripping anybody off here. Um, it's a huge win-win. It's a service that is needed. And without investors, uh, people who go in and fix up properties, we would be in a world of a lot of hurt. We would be in a, a world of a lot of hurt. Anyway, <laughs> it would be bad news. Investors are critical um, in in our world. They just are. Um, we talked about picking inventory, finding the right houses, where to start. And then we talked about your far, farm area, deciding what location to start with. And then we talked about the four pillars of your house flipping business, your machine, um, and how those all work together. So the next video, we will be talking about the five steps of deal analysis, and we will see you there.